Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jameson Miller. I'm Director of Teaching and Learning here at Lumen Learning. And today we'll be hearing from our co-founder and Chief Academic Officer, David Wiley, who's going to show some of the work that we're doing now um, to use data for our continuous improvement of OER. I'll let you take it from here, David. Oh, before, before David does take over, um, I want everyone to be aware that um, at the bottom of your Zoom window, you should see both uh, buttons for a chat, um, but also for a Q&A. So if you do have questions uh, that you'd like us to address um, at the question and answer towards the end of the session, try to lean towards the Q&A uh, to enter those. Uh, however, I'll try to keep an eye on both the, the chat and the, and the Q&A sections um, to, to try to make sure we address your questions. So with that, uh, take it away, David. Thanks, Jameson. And uh, thank you everybody for being here for this webinar. This is some work that I'm really super excited about and really excited to share with you. Um, if you didn't get a chance to go uh, see the slides here or get the link, it's in the chat box so you can access it there. Um, and then you can kind of follow along or you can review the slides again later when the webinar is over, uh, however you'd like to use those. So we want to talk about partnering uh, around continuous improvement in order to improve learning with OER. And I wanna start by uh, just expressing this idea that all learning materials are hypotheses. And what I mean when I say that is that every time you sit down to create any kind of learning materials, whether it's a single unit or it's an entire textbook or it's an instructional video, whatever it is, when you make learning materials you are expressing, whether you're doing it implicitly uh, or you're doing it in a very explicit way, all kinds of hypotheses about how you think uh, students are going to learn. And you're answering just an almost infinite number of questions, you know, about what kinds of patterns you should use as you present content, about what the role of worked examples should be, about how practice should be spaced out uh, in the work that students will do. If you're going to invite them to do like pre predict, observe, explain kinds of activities, and if so, at what point will you use those? Is feedback going to be immediate or are you going to delay it? If you're going to delay it, is it, are you going to delay it according to a specific algorithm? Which one? If you're going to connect explicitly to prior knowledge, whose prior knowledge are you going to try to connect to? Are, you going to, are students going to have multiple attempts uh, on any assessments they might be taking? All of these questions and a thousand more uh, have to be answered when you create learning materials, whether you answer them uh, in a thoughtful kind of explicit way or whether you're just making assumptions. So all of these hypotheses about if I use this kind of define, explain, exemplify pattern and I schedule my practice in this way and I do this and I do this, you're building up a hypothesis about what you can do in the learning materials that will support student learning. And then, you know, there are multiple levels of this happening. So at the micro level, I think at first we think about, uh, you know, what specific things can we ask students to read, to watch, to do, when to do it, et cetera, to support them learning an individual skill. But then there are questions about how we explicitly support and scaffold integration and synthesis of multiple skills into kind of higher order orchestrated performances we want them to make. And then even higher level questions about what specific things can we do in learning materials to support transfer and application outside the classroom. So there are all kinds of hypotheses about what is going to support student learning expressed in learning materials, whether we're thoughtful about it or not. But this is the point I really wanna drive home at the beginning here, that all learning materials are hypotheses about what's going to support student learning. Um, you may know, from your own work or maybe from the history of science that initial hypotheses are seldom correct. Um, they're often close, sometimes they're not even close, but initial hypotheses are seldom correct and we make progress as we make, we state hypotheses, we test them and we refine them and we do that iteratively and we test and we refine and we test again and we further refine and we go through that process. So if learning materials are hypotheses and hypotheses need to be tested and refined, what would that look like in the case of learning materials? Um, I, I think it, it breaks up pretty easily into two parts. That test is about just doing educational research. Educational research can help us identify where our original hypotheses were wrong, or in other words, where the materials aren't really supporting student learning. 
And in the context of refine, OER actually give us permission to change the learning materials. Or in other words, OER give us permission to update our hypotheses. In a world where you're working from traditionally copyrighted education materials, you might be able to do educational research to see where those materials aren't supporting student learning. But then copyright prevents you from actually updating your hypotheses, from changing what the materials say, what they're asking students to do, the sequence they're asking them to do things in, et cetera. So importantly, you know, educational research lets us do the testing. OER give us permission to do the refining. So when we bring these two things together, when we bring education research and OER together, then learning materials are not just hypotheses, but in this case, learning materials become hypotheses that can be tested and can be refined, and that testing and refinement can happen term after term after term after term, resulting in learning materials that should improve student learning and improve it further and improve it further over time. Um, if we had all the time and energy and money in the world, then we would do all kinds of testing, we would do all kinds of refining, uh, but none of us actually live in that world. So we need to be very specific about what we're going to test and where we're gonna spend our effort in refinement. And so one of the questions that we've been particularly interested in is, you know, how can we zero in on which OER are really least effective in supporting student learning? Or in other words, where were our hypotheses the most wrong uh, right out of the gate? And uh, gosh, two years ago now, uh, two of my grad students at BYU and I published this paper in a RODL about the RISE framework. And RISE is a way of using data to identify uh, OER that are in need of continuous improvement. And I want to just explain the RISE framework to you very quickly. You can think about RISE analysis as sort of a two by two table with the horizontal here across the bottom being the degree to which students engage with the course content. Because if they don't read the content or don't use the content or watch it or do the practice, if they don't interact with it in any way, um, you know, then there are probably other issues we need to solve rather than trying to improve the course materials. So across the horizontal is content engagement and then the vertical is assessment performance. And we're looking specifically at student performance on assessments that are aligned directly to uh, you know, topics that are covered in the content. So there's a default hypothesis here that goes kind of up and to the right. These are the green boxes. When content engagement is low, we would expect student performance to be low. When they don't study, when they don't read, we'd expect students to not do very well. Uh, in the top right-hand corner, when content engagement is high, they're doing the readings, they're using the formative assessments, they're watching the videos, they're doing the practice, we'd expect their performance to be pretty high as well. So those green boxes are kind of the default hypotheses. Um, you know, the yellow box is one that we can spend more time talking about another time. It's somewhat interesting, but the red box is really the one for the purposes of continuous improvement that I think is the most interesting. This is the place where students are really highly engaged with the content, they're doing the practice, they're doing the interactives, they're doing the readings, they're watching the videos, but they're still performing poorly on the assessments. So, uh, you know, it seems like content that ends up in this box is content that is a good candidate to be worked on and to be improved. <clears throat> now, it's worth saying um, that RISE analysis implies a certain kind of instructional design. In fact, when I first blogged uh, about this article after it was published, uh, I got one of my favorite comments on my blog of all time with a, a person who came and said, you know, RISE analysis all sounds great in theory, uh, but it sounds like what you're describing would only work if every single piece of content in the course were aligned with a learning outcome and every single assessment item in a course were aligned with a learning outcome. And since that never actually happens in practice, uh, the RISE framework is kind of interesting in theory, but, but not particularly useful in practice. And that person is right. If you don't have outcome alignment happening in your instructional design, RISE analysis uh, is impossible to do. So you, know, you th think about the outcome as being the center of everything. You've got content represented here on the left, those sorts of activities and assessments on the right. What we want to be able to do when students take an item on a summative assessment or a cluster of items on a summative assessment and they miss those items, we want to be able to say, hmm, 
students did poorly here, what outcome was this item supposed to be assessing and what activities were supposed to prepare students to succeed on this item? And so if this alignment exists, then I can go from performance assessment and trace back into content and formative assessments and other things that were supposed to pre prepare students. And I can do a rise analysis when I have my instructional design set up in this fashion. And so, you know, if you go and you look at that first paper, you'll see uh, visualizations that look like this, where in the original paper, we used page views as a measure of content engagement. And then here uh, on the vertical again is score. And each dot in this graph is a learning outcome in a course. And the dark horizontal and vertical bars in the center, the kind of origin point, that's where the average score on assessments intersects with the average uh, use of content in the course. And then just to round out the story, this, uh, the blue diamond here is drawn three standard deviations out from that origin. So things that are outside of that blue diamond really are outliers. They're things that are really, uh, really kind of different. There's something odd going on here. So this is what the result of a RISE analysis would look like. So we can see down here, number one, two, three, four, five, six. We can see these individual learning outcomes where students are engaging with the content in a greater than average amount, but performing on the assessments a lower than average amount. And I should say the units in this graph um, are z-scores. So if you're playing along with the home version of the webinar, here's an opportunity for you to do your own RISE analysis. And I want to show an example of this uh, really quickly because through a partnership that um, we've been talking about uh, elsewhere that Lumen and Carnegie Mellon University have established around open learning analytics tools, the work that we've done on RISE analysis, which before, although it was open source, uh, was available as an R package and required a fair amount of programming and other kind of expertise to be able to do, RISE has now been integrated into LearnSphere in a way that is super simple for anyone to conduct a RISE analysis. And I just wanna walk you through it really quickly. Um, so first, if, you, if you'll open this top link, it will take you over to uh, a RISE analysis data template. These are the kinds of data that you need to do a RISE analysis. And these are made up data. Uh, so you're fine you know, doing whatever you'd like to do with them. But you can see here are learning outcomes in the course. Here are average scores on quiz, exam, items that were aligned specifically with this outcome. And here is engagement with all the content in the course that is in support of that outcome. So from here, you can just say file, uh, download as, and download a CSV copy uh, of this document. That's the first step in the process. And then you can visit the LearnSphere workflow rise analysis here. And it's gonna ask you, to log in, I'm gonna, and you can log in with any of your social accounts. I'm gonna log in with my GitHub account. You can ignore uh, that error that pops up, but what you'll see here is um, a set of blocks. This is what the LearnSphere analysis toolkit looks like. It's also open source, super interesting. If you're interested in data analysis at all, I'd encourage you to go have a look at it. Um, and basically all we have here is some data that are wired up, uh, data on the left hand, uh, this block on the right hand side uh, where the data are wired up to the analysis and I'm going to show you how to actually get the data in here now. So uh, and I'm just following the steps here. So step three is click save as at the top here and choose any kind of name. It can be actually anything we want and save it as a new analysis and it's going to give us our own copy of this workflow that that we can work in. Uh, so once your new copy of the workflow is open here, you'll see step four is to click the gear on the import block. So here's the import block and I'm going to click the gear. And then here I'm going to go to step five where I'm going to upload my own data. I have to certify that any data that I'm uploading meets IRB requirements and since these are made up data, they do. Uh, it's a CSV file that I'm uploading. And now I'm going to go choose a file from somewhere here. And you'll see here that 
After I've uploaded the file, step seven, click add to data set and say yes. And then when that finishes processing, I can just close this import options window. Now my data are in here and I'm ready to run my RISE analysis. So the final steps are to click run and then results at the top of the page. So this will just run for a second. And again, this whole tool set from Carnegie Mellon is open source. The RISE analysis components are open source. All of this is open. Uh, and if I click on results, then it will bring me over here where it shows me, by default, it shows me the data that I uploaded. But step 10 here is to click analysis one at the top. And when I do that, now here I can see this RISE diagram. I can zoom in and out on. And here is the original data that I uploaded along with the kind of uh, additional statistics that RISE calculates for you about which quadrant it ends up in, whether it's inside or outside that three standard deviation boundary and how far away from the origin it is. So this whole process now through our collaboration with Carnegie Mellon is a 10 step process that you can do in three minutes. And that's super exciting. Just two months ago, this was a lot harder to do. Um, but you know, if, if you're thinking about this, you're probably saying to yourself, well, sure, the analysis might be really simple to run now, but like, where would I get data like that? Because I don't have data where every single piece of content and every individual assessment item is outcome aligned. Um, so that's where the, the topic of the webinar today in terms of partnering really comes into focus. You may be familiar with this quote by Herb Simon. If you've ever heard Norman Beer from Carnegie Mellon uh, speak or Candace Till or me or a bunch of other people, you've probably heard this quote. Ross Strader from our team will use this quote as well. Herb Simon, uh, if you're not familiar with his work, he's this incredible polymath who won the Nobel Prize in economics and won the Turing Award, which is the computer science equivalent of the Nobel. So he's a very clever fellow who's working at a very high level. But I love this quote that improvement in post-secondary education will require converting teaching from a solo sport to a community-based research activity. And you know, as much as I love this quote, it's taken me a long time to start to appreciate what he meant by a community-based research activity. And I'm not sure that I fully understand it yet. And everything that I'm about to talk about now is you should consider kind of a first draft, a first attempt, a beta of work that Lumen is trying to do and that we want to invite you to do with us. And, and I think this work requires a community-based approach because of the really wide diversity of expertise that's required and just the sheer amount of effort that is required as well. Like when you think about everything that goes into doing the testing piece of this, there's you know design of educational research experiments, there's IRB and human subjects expertise, instrumentation, data collection, analysis, viz and communicate. There's all kinds of expertise required on the testing side. And there's a broad range of expertise required on the refining side. You, you have to have somebody who knows the subject matter. You have to have the learning science and the learning, engineering, learning engineering expertise, multimedia development if you're going to do interactives or simulations or formative assessments that provide real-time feedback, accessibility, project management. Like there's all these pieces that have to come together. And that's really only going to happen, I, I think what Simon is trying to tell us is the only way to do this is to put together a community. Even a team is probably too small. You need a community-based approach. And so, you know, that, that doesn't just happen by accident. It takes some active facilitation. And so what I wanna kind of walk you through now is the way that we're thinking about how Lumen can do as part of the community, some of this work on behalf of the community as our contribution, particularly the testing part, in a way that's open and transparent and then how we can participate with the community uh, in doing refining it and uh, do some facilitation and project management as part of that as well. Because like I said, I don't think any of this pretty complicated work can just happen by accident. It's gonna take some hands-on facilitation and managing. So 
what Lumen is signing up to do is many things we've already done. So aggregating OER, aligning OER to learning outcomes, creating, finding, reusing assessments and aligning those assessments to learning outcomes, setting up instrumentation that works across LMSs so that wherever you might uh, encounter a Lumen Waymaker course, uh, all of this is going to work. And then doing two kinds of research specifically, doing item analysis and doing rise analysis. An item analysis, because it deals with the content of the actual summative assessments, we won't be publishing to the public, but we will be doing work on the results of item analysis in faculty workshops. Uh, we recently did one at Old Miss, which was amazing. And if you're at OLC, you heard us uh, talk about that experience. Um, and our partners at SUNY are also very excited about this work and engaged in the continuous improvement pieces of, of this as well. But the item analysis reporting will happen kind of behind closed doors with faculty where we'll work through opportunities to improve uh, assessment items. But RISE analysis, looking at how the content is performing, like we were talking about a minute ago, we're doing, we've been doing, but going forward, we're gonna do, and we're gonna publicly report on that. And I'm gonna show what that looks like in just a moment. I'm gonna talk through how all this works and then I'm gonna show you how it works uh, in a minute. So then the refined piece of that is once Lumen does the work of doing all the analysis and publishing the RISE results, um, then both we, and we've been doing this ourselves for years now, um, you know, we'll continue to go in, find content that looks like it's not performing uh, up to scratch and do work on that. But now the community will be able to join in that activity and suggest improvements. And everything from just leaving a comment that says, I can tell you why this isn't working, but I don't have time to help you fix it, through, hey, I've actually edited the OER for you. Here are some changes uh, that you should just accept and use, to, hey, here's this other OER that for some reason you didn't know about or evaluate um, that you should use in addition to the OER that's already in there or that you could use instead of. And I hope that you see in these last two bullets in terms of either editing OER, creating new OER, finding other OER, that there's some really interesting kind of open pedagogy opportunities here in the continuous improvement process. And then as those contributions come in, or as they try to come in, there needs to be support provided to contributors through that process. And I'm gonna show you what that support looks like uh, in its current form, and I'm really interested in your thoughts about how we can provide better support. Um, but then someone has to review, someone has to confirm outcome alignment, confirm that the licensing is clean, integrate all those suggestions back into the OER, that then with these two blue bullets out at the bottom can be put back out into the world, can be used so that the test and refine cycle can be repeated over and over again, and then importantly, I think there's a really interesting opportunity here for Lumen to provide tenure and promotion documentation back to people who contribute so that there is a way for them to recognize, be recognized and be rewarded for the cont contributions and improvements that they make beyond just the attribution that will be in the OER. So lumenlearning.com slash improving learning is where uh, all of this is happening, it is going to happen. Oop. So let me open a new tab and let's go there. And you are welcome to, to follow along, of course. Um, so there's a shortcut here at the top. Once you understand everything that's on this page and don't feel like you need to read it anymore, that's fine. But here there's a little more context, you know, about the Herb Simon quote and what it is that Lumen's going to try to do as part of the community that's engaged in this community-based activity. But under how do I begin, you can see here this community-based continuous improvement site. So I'm going to open this up. And I'm going to switch from my Lumen account to my personal account so that I don't have superpowers because superpowers would be confusing. So here is a set of folders uh, reflecting many of our Waymaker courses. And I'm going to drop into one of these, um, say biology for non-majors. And here you'll see at the top a document titled Start Here, uh, Review the RISE Analysis. Now, if you're a Google Drive user and your default sorting is set to 
sort by last modified by or something else, this is going to look a little different from you uh, on your screen. I have it uh, sorted by name. But number one, start here. So here's the RISE analysis for biology for majors. You see it says these are data for uh, spring of 19. And in case you forgot what the RISE analysis is, this is just identifying learning outcomes where students were most engaged with the aligned learning materials and performed worst on the aligned assessments. So here are the 10 outcomes uh, that have the greatest RISE distance, uh, or in other words, are furthest out from the center point down in the right-hand quadrant. And they're numbered here so that you can see uh, how they, which dot uh, is which outcome up here in the list. Um, so you can look through this list of outcomes and you can say to yourself, gosh, um, you know, th this, this one down here close to the bottom, define the different layers of protein structure. I actually have an awesome activity I do in class. Um, I think I teach this really well. I think I can help fix this problem. Um, so I'll come back to this folder. And now as I go down below the start here, you'll see that for each of those outcomes, there's another Google Doc. And if I open this, then what you're gonna see here is at the top of every one of these pages, pages is some scaffolding around how to contribute. And then below that is all the content uh, from the course that's aligned with this learning outcome. So in, in terms of how to contribute, oh, I should say here that, you know, there's, a, there's this note here at the top that says, if you're contributing, you're contributing under a CC BY version four license. All of Lumen's improvements are licensed this way uh, and re-released as part of our uh, OER on our website. And so uh, that the standard that we're using for ourselves is the one that we're asking the community to uh, follow as well. But so, you know, here are different ways that you can contribute. For example, in this first one, you can just share, just share thoughts about why students who use the material aren't learning. And you can do that by leaving a comment below in the Google Doc. And if you've never left a comment in a Google Doc before, you can jump over to this How to Contribute page. And here is a 27 second video. Uh, I'll just mute the audio there that walks you through the process of how to leave a comment in a Google Doc if you've never done that before. So there are videos about how to suggest additional OER, how to make small edits of the content, um, to make all the kinds of changes that you might want to make. So this scaffolding is here to remind you what kinds of things you might do in terms of suggesting how the content can be better. And there are those video tutorials. Um, when we programmatically pull the content out of uh, our platform and put it into Google Docs, sometimes there's formatting that gets lost that makes it a little difficult to understand. So at the top of every page, there's a link back to this page in the Candela platform so you can see what it actually originally looked like. Um, and then you may notice at the top right here that it's green and it says suggesting. When you drop into these Google Docs, you don't have edit permissions, you have suggestion permissions. And that's nice because then when you want to leave a comment or suggest a change, say if I make a comment here, then you'll see that it actually pops up with my, my name there. It knows who I am because I'm in this case, I'm logged into Google Drive and I can leave a comment of some kind. If you're not logged in or for some reason when you get here, you go to leave a comment, it says anonymous at the top. The video tutorial reminds you to leave your name and your email address so that we can attribute your contribution. Um, but so you can make comments here like this. You might come down here and say, oh, um, actually, uh, here's a, a better explanation or he, here's something that's going, something that you ought to include. You'll see that as I type that in, it comes in in a different color and it's automatically attributed out here in the side so I know who it is. Um, again, if you're not logged into Google Drive when you do this, uh, you need to leave your name and your email address here so that we can attribute you correctly. But, um, you know, for the more technical among you, you might say, gosh, this this whole continuous improvement task seems like a task that was custom made to be done in GitHub. And I don't disagree with you, except that GitHub turns out to be really hard for a lot of people to wrap their heads around, while as Google Docs is something that basically everyone understands how to open up a word processing document, start typing into it, 
And with suggestion mode here, we get automated attributions to the little insertions that you might make or comments or things like that. So instead of trying to push this into GitHub and setting a technical bar that's very high for people to contribute, we're using Google Docs as kind of a GitHub light to coordinate this work. So um, hopefully that gives you an idea of how you could um, drop in here, suggest a small change. You could write an entirely new paragraph. And here you could drop in a new image, embed a new video, just to leave a comment. Or if you really wanted to go to town, um, then you might have seen this number four here, to make larger edits. You can just say file, make a copy, and this will cr just copy this entire doc over into a new place for you where only you have access to it. And you can work on it alone. You can invite students to collaborate with you. You can just totally tear it up and then come back and put the link to the copy that you made here so that we can find those changes that you're suggesting and review them uh, to be rolled back in to what's going on. At the end of all of that, then I think is this opportunity for tenure, uh, letters for tenure and promotion binders. And I'm particularly interested in your feedback on what this letter might include in order for it to be useful to you. I've been through the tenure and promotion process twice at two different institutions, and so I have a little idea of how it works, but I know that it really does vary depending on, on where you are and what your local circumstances are like. But this letter, you know, will say something along the lines of what you see on the screen here, to whom it may concern, this person's made this contribution to this open courseware, it went through this review process. Since they made that contribution, it's been used by how many of our thousand students across the United States as the required learning materials for the course that they were enrolled in. And some other large number of people viewed their contribution on Lumen's OER website, which had just over 43 million visits last year. Um, so I think this kind of documentation hopefully will be helpful to people who say to themselves, gosh, I have half an hour, I have an hour. I could spend some time improving OER, or I could spend some time writing an article, or I could spend some time, like I wanna do something my institution's actually going to reward me for. Hopefully a letter like this can let the OER improvement work that you do turn into something that your institution can figure out how to reward you for in terms of tenure and promotion. So, I know I was talking pretty fast. I don't know if you can tell, I'm pretty excited about this work. Um, but I do think that by making this a community-based activity where we each kind of contribute the expertise that we have, I think we can improve student learning. I think we can make it better every single term. I think we can reward contributors. And I think this can all happen in a way that can be sustainable over the long term um, because it's built um, I have a, I've written a couple of blog posts about this as well, if you're interested. Um, this approach is based on a lot of research done by people in the open source software space about how successful, scalable, and sustainable open source software projects are run. So if you're interested in reading some of that literature, uh, you can find some of that on the blog as well. And that's the end of the slides. I think we have like 25 minutes left uh, for conversation, questions, feedback, discussion, things like that. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening to the kind of first draft of what may seem like a crazy idea, uh, but appreciate your willingness to listen and, and hopefully to give some, uh, some feedback and share some thoughts here as well. So um, let's, I see there's been activity in the chat and maybe in the Q&A as well. And Jameson, you've been watching that closer than I have, but maybe you can help me through this process. Yeah, yeah, I got you. So um, the first question that came through uh, had to do when you were explaining the visualization of the rise analysis. And mm -hmm. um, if you could just, uh, the specific question was uh, exactly what the dots represented um, within that, that framework. So um, sounds like yeah, someone so, like you to review that. Yeah, let me just explain that one more time. So each of these dots uh, in the rise uh, visualization represents a learning outcome in the course, um, you know, something like a student will be able to, you know, factor a polynomial, what, whatever the learning outcome might be. Each of these represents a learning outcome. And then the horizontal axis here is the degree to which students were engaged with the content that was 
in the course in support of that learning outcome, aligned with that learning outcome. And the vertical component is the average score uh, of students across all the assessments that were aligned with or were assessing that learning outcome. So hopefully that addresses that question. Yeah, looks like looks like they're satisfied with that one. Um, the next question that came in um, uh, was one that um, I've got in the answered section here because I, I um, said I would bring it up, but it's uh, the question here is you know clear to somebody who who likes what they see but wants to know how to accomplish it uh, within their context. It says uh, if my institution doesn't have instructional designers and is unlikely to hire any right now, do you have any recommendations or specific of specific online courses? or professional development opportunities that faculty and librarians can take to build these skills? Um, yeah, so answering those questions kind of in reverse order, um, we've been doing, you know, I mentioned before uh, the, the faculty workshop that we recently did at Ole Miss and other work that we've been doing with SUNY. Um, I have a goal to do many, many more of these faculty workshops this year and uh, into the first half of next year. And there will be other people from Lumen who will be doing them as well. So if you'd like to learn more about the technique, talk through the paper, ask questions about the paper, dig further into, I know I really blew through the, uh, how to do the rise analysis in LearnSphere or how to do it in our studio um, you know, but we'll be able to do more of that kind of hands-on training in a workshop setting. The question really is how do you get these kinds of data? Because, um, you know, to my knowledge, um, there aren't many learning management systems that let you tag kind of smallish pieces of content and individual assessment items at this level and give you the data out in the, in the format that you need. And in as much as that is not true, um, then really the, the, the place where you can get this kind of analysis is you can, get these, you can get this analysis from Lumen for OER that you might be using either because you're using uh, Lumen's Waymaker or you're using other, you're using OER that are similar to the OER that were in Waymaker, but you're not using Waymaker specifically. Um, you could also get these kinds of data for any of the Carnegie Mellon uh, Open Learning Initiative courses through the Pittsburgh Science of Learning Center uh, data shop where they uh, collect data like this and make it available to people who have, you know, research, faculty researcher credentials. Um, and, and one of the, well, maybe I'll stop there. <laughs> yes, <laughs> got a, we got a, going. Yeah, we got a few more questions coming in. I think that's a good start there. Um, several of you are asking if a recording is going to be available, and, and yes, we'll, we'll make sure to send a link to the recording to everyone who registered uh, today, not just people who came, but everyone who registered. <clears throat> so next, uh, here's another question from uh, Audrey. Uh, can you explain how updates, changes to the course materials get rolled out now and uh, how they will get rolled out for each semester? Yeah, and I'll actually risk turning on my video here momentarily. Um, I realized I had it off. Uh, how, how those get rolled out? So the way those get rolled out is they are integrated into the... Um, into the OER that are the content part of the Waymaker courseware. Um, so if you go to lumenlearning.com and at the top you click the big yellow button that says courses that takes you into the course catalog and you click on any course there and then click the big blue button that says uh, view course outcomes and content, then that will drop you into all of the OER, all the content for each of these courses. And every time those improvements are rolled into this OER and then released, that's where they're released. They're released uh, on that site where they're openly available to the public and all the improvements are CC by licensed. And they're also released as part of the Waymaker courseware for that next term. And that's how that, um, that's how that continuous improvement cycle works. They're made available that next term. And at the end of the next term, we do more rise analyses and keep moving forward. Great, great. So next question actually um, is, is, is a little bit related to that um, from Kelvin uh, Bentley, um, where we've got a question, uh, if there will be any scheduled sprints for these kind of contributions uh, to the improvements along the way to kind of focus some of that work. Um, and on top of that, asking um, how often Lumen will be making the updates to the Waymaker contents. Yeah, so 
Sprints is an idea that we've kicked, kicked around both face-to-face -face and virtually. We'll probably do one at open ed. Um, we'll, we'll probably also do some virtual uh, ones as well, where it's just kind of we all get on Twitter and talk to each other and sprint through some of this improvement together. Um, you know, there are some similar activities, kind of similar activities that uh, like OpenStax has their creator fest where they get folks together to work on ancillary materials like PowerPoints and things like that. Um, but th these sprints, you know, the, the goal of this work is to actually improve the core instructional materials as opposed to creating supplemental uh, materials. So as we do, so the short, well, I'm doing a terrible job of giving short answers. I'm just really worked up about this. Um, you know, we, we'll definitely be doing sprints that will be virtual. We'll be doing some that are face-to-face. -face. We'll continue to do on-campus workshops. Um, if those, oh, something that I forgot to mention, um, and as long as I'm still screen sharing, which I believe I am, Yes. Um, if I hop back here over to uh, this lumenlearning.com slash improving learning partway down this page, uh, where do I ask questions and get help? There's a link to a mailing list that we've set up to coordinate some of this work. So if you're interested in being notified about when a virtual sprint or a sprint that's happening like for a half day at a conference, or you know where we're going to be doing face-to-face -face workshops, that listserv would be the place to join to kind of track and follow that work. Great. Um, uh, uh, next question here is an interesting one. Olga Kopp is asking, uh, are the contributions, uh, you know, we're, we're inviting people to engage through uh, Google Drive there. Um, are this only from teachers or are students going to be able to give feedback? No, absolutely. So that's why I said, um, at least I intended to say, I may have passed over it in my exuberance, that I think there's some really interesting um, kind of opportunities around open pedagogy or OEP or OER enabled pedagogy or wh whatever you know, language you want to use um, to tell students at the beginning of the semester, hey, as we're going through here, I'm, I'm just highlighting for you at the beginning of the term, here are the 10 topics that students all across the country struggled with the most last semester as we went through here. And as you go through, as we work through this, and you're reading the textbook and whatever, listening to what we, what I talk about in class, doing the activity that we do together in class and small groups, whatever, when that light bulb goes off for you and there's, you, you understand it, there's an opportunity for you to go ahead and make a contribution here to write a new paragraph or to make a three minute video of yourself on your phone, explaining this with a better example or whatever and contribute that back as well. Um, it could be a faculty member, it could be a student, it could be a person who just works in the profession who randomly, uh, you know, when, when 43 million people hit the website looking for OER, not all of those are students and uh, teachers, right? We know there are more people that are interested in these topics. Um, so anybody's welcome to contribute. All the contributions will go through the same kind of review and vetting process. Um, so absolutely, I would think it would be really exciting to see a lot of students contributing. And they would be attributed by name and everything just like anyone else would be uh, in the attribution section at the bottom of each page. Excellent, excellent. Um, moving along here, uh, Audrey Fish again is asking um, for a little bit more uh, explanation on the data for the RISE analysis and where it comes from. Um, so for instance, uh, if I'm teaching a specific course, will I be able to see the RISE analysis for data across institutions for that course? So the, the RISE analysis that you see in the Google Drive is the RISE analysis that includes all of the data that students have given us permission to include for research purposes. So uh, when, when students use Waymaker, at the very beginning, there's a research consent uh, there's an IRB that's managed by Carnegie Mellon that I think I've said a time or two as our, our partner on a lot of this research, um, where students can either opt in or opt out of their data being used for things like this. Uh, next, uh, related to the, the TNP uh, comments you're making. So here's uh, someone, Karen Rogers, has been working with faculty on creating OER for Spanish courses, and they're bothered by the idea that their work wouldn't count towards uh, tenure and promotion. I think we all are. My work, <laughs> my work on OER didn't count toward tenure and promotion. I can tell you that. Um, so is there a process that Lumen goes through to accept OER material uh, and then do this type of analysis? Like, um, 
I guess she's looking at how we have our other efforts we have towards formalizing that. Yeah, I, I can't say really right now exactly what the process will look like. It will be some kind of review. It will involve subject matter experts. It will involve learning scientists. And I don't know. That's part of what we have to figure out as this goes forward is exactly what the shape of that review will be. Um, I'm particularly interested if you have ideas about, you know, forms of review that would be seen as more credible or more interesting by your tenure and promotion committees. Um, if you have ideas about that, it'd be great if you would share them because the whole point of doing these letters is to make them useful specifically in that context. Um, but yeah, but this is brand new. So I, I, I can't give a lot of detail about that other than to say that there will be people who know the discipline and there will be people who know the instructional design and the learning science both involved in the process. So uh, here's another question. I'm going to kind of synthesize uh, a secondary one from Kelvin Bentley and from Corey Bergeron uh, around uh, collaboration outside of the, the Lumen courses. So um, is there interest uh, or are we talking to um, OpenStax, Merlot, other private publishers about, um, you know, how to engage with these RISE analyses um, or to apply these kind of analyses and implementations towards their own, their content? Yeah. So I guess two things I would say there are first, um, everything about RISE is open. The, the peer reviewed paper is in Erodal. Uh, the R package for doing RISE analysis is MIT licensed. The LearnSphere integration, all of LearnSphere is also open source as well. So anybody who wants to do RISE analysis, they're totally empowered with all the kind of intellectual background in the paper, all of the code that they would need to run those analyses, things like that. Um, in terms of collaborating on analyses, it's kind of interesting. If you think about learning materials as being a collection of hypotheses about, you know, this kind of example, this metaphor, this practice done on this schedule is what's going to support student learning. Um, you know, OpenStax hypothesis about that is a different hypothesis than Lumen's hypothesis, which is a different hypothesis than Pearson's hypothesis, which is a different one than, you know, it, any of the 40 things that you would pull out of Merlot, each of those represents a different set of answers to those thousands of questions about what is going to support student learning. And so th there's not really, I think, a meaningful sense in which you could bring aligned assessment data from OpenStax and from McGraw and from Pearson and from Lumen all together to answer questions about, um, you know, where do the content need the most help? Because in each of those cases, the content represents a very different set of hypotheses about what will support student learning. Um, so are we interested in lots of people using RISE? Absolutely. Are we making everything about it open, open source, doing workshops on it? Yes. But would it, is there some meaningful way in which two different, you know, two different sets of courseware could have their aligned assessment data dumped into a common pile and collaborate on that analysis? Probably not. There probably are some pretty interesting questions you could ask around, here are three different, uh, you know, OER based approaches and in this case, it looks like students are doing much better on this outcome than in the second case. Maybe we should take the OER from that first case and integrate it into the second and third collections of OER because it looks like whatever was happening over there was more effective. There could be that kind of comparative kind of cross-pollinization that could happen. But I don't really think there's a meaningful way that you can collaborate on analyses across different collections of learning material because each of them represent a different hypothesis. Yeah, very specific, okay. Um, so uh, here's a question that uh, involves um, how how the RISE analysis or, or this approach can engage with uh, a little bit larger context, a little bit larger student context. And that's uh, from Tatiana Kurdowski and, and CUNY, um, who's a mathematics uh, instructor that designs OER math courses. Um, and she's like, she makes the point that no course exists by itself in a bubble, that a course has prerequisites. And in so designing the content, the prerequisite student knowledge is critical um, to the content yeah. development. Uh, so when learning outcomes are listed for a course, is there any information on what kind of prerequisite the course had or, 
or where that course exists in a sequence? Yeah, uh, absolutely not. Rise is blind to a whole range of things. And the, the biggest thing that it's blind to, and I hope you'll agree that this is true, um, is what the teacher is doing in the classroom. You know, in, in the context of the RISE analyses that we're doing, I, I think our assumption is that generally Waymaker is used either in a blended or a flipped way um, where students are working through the OER, doing all the practice, getting all the feedback, even taking their first attempt on the uh, end of unit quiz and then coming to class and the teacher is using the data that came out of that to do something interesting or smart, um, you know, based on where students' current understanding is in the classroom. RISE can't capture that at all, right? And I think of all the effects of everything that you could know about students in terms of demography, of what's going on with them in terms of food security, homelessness, all, all the stuff that's going on, I think it's hard to point to a bigger effect than the teacher effect, right? Um, we have a, a, a long-term ongoing argument in my research group at BYU about and now I'm going to soapbox for just a minute, but you provoked me, so I apologize in advance. But when you think about all the things that contribute to student learning from their background to prerequisites to the effect of the teacher, what actually is the biggest possible effect that learning materials can have? There's some limit on the effect learning materials can have because some learning is accounted for by the teacher. Some of the learning is accounted for by the student and their background. There, there's each of the, there's some pie that gets cut up so that some of the impact on learning is represented by the learning materials. And how, what's the theoretical upper limit of the impact of learning materials? Like if we get a 10 point improvement, should we say, hooray, that's like the most that could ever be made just by learning materials alone? Or should we say, oh my gosh, that's only one fifth of the available impact that we could be making. That's just a complete, it's a question we have no idea. No one has any idea what the answer to that question is. Um, but it does kind of relate to this question of well, what about the impact of the teacher? What about the impact of prerequisites? What about the impact of all the things going on in the student's life with their job and with their mom who passed away and all these other things? RISE is blind to all of that. RISE, you know, its name is Resource Inspection, Selection, and Enhancement. It's really only focused on learning materials. There's a much richer picture of what's going on, but RISE by itself is only trying to capture this one part. There are other test and refine cycles that we would run for each of those other things, right? Uh, great, so given the limited time, I'm gonna jump, let's see. Um, <laughs> let's see, well, um, real quickly, uh, Audrey Fish asks, um, are the cartridges that we use, uh, I assume she's talking about Waymaker cartridges currently in use, uh, automatically updated with the, with the new content? So if you're a Waymaker user, then um, smallish changes, uh, smallish improvements are automatically put in uh, to those um, because the way that Waymaker works, as I think you know, is that it all lives in a central platform that is WordPress plus Pressbooks plus a bunch of other, uh, the Candela stack of plugins on top of that, lives outside the LMS. And then we use LTI to show that single source of OER inside lots of different LMSs. So when a continuous improvement is made, when a small one is made, it can just be made there. And then it's automatically reflected in every cartridge um, that everyone is using in any LMS. Bigger changes, um, bigger changes are not things that we would roll out kind of over top of what you're already doing. A bigger change would go into a new cartridge and you'd have to sit, you'd have to raise your hand and say, you took out two complete modules and put in three new ones and did these other major structural things. I want that new really revised version. Give me a new cartridge. Um, so there is some line, you know, below which there are new paragraph here, a new video there, a new interactive activity here, that kind of stuff will drop in and will be immediately reflected in your current cartridge. Bigger structural things that would cause you to come into class and say, wait, the reading I assigned <laughs> had disappeared? You know, things like that, you'd have to request a new cartridge and deploy a new cartridge for. 
Um, so a question here that I think you actually already addressed, but uh, Jessica Trailer's got another uh, great question about student involvement. You know, your thoughts about including students in the, the content improvement process. I think you brought that in uh, well already. So that question was from a little earlier. Uh, William but, Carr. Can I, can I say one more thing about it before you pass over, Jameson? Because um, I, I do think it's true that although the best faculty really are students at heart, um, we're, we're no longer students culturally. And I don't think anybody can explain something to a student as well as another student can. The kinds of examples that they will pull out of Game of Thrones or where, you know, wherever they pull the, the final episode of the Big Bang Theory or the latest song by the, the types of things that they'll pull out as they connect the other students' prior knowledge with this new thing that they're trying to help them understand Students every single time will do a better job of that than I will or than you will because they're They're part of their they, they have more shared prior knowledge than we have with them And so to the degree that you can involve students in this work, you're doing them a favor. You're doing future students a favor um, You know when a student does an explanatory video or writes a new paragraph or gives a new example or puts a little box and says, here's a case study, or here's an example that you might think about. Um, as long as the information in there is, is correct, and you need to vet that because it is not always correct, um, but it, as long as it's kind of factually accurate, those kinds of connections that students can help each other draw are just super powerful. And if you know the literature on reciprocal teaching, you know that there are huge benefits for the student who is writing those new explanations recording that new video, doing whatever it is that they're doing. So I think the possibilities around student involvement, both to benefit the student who's creating the new OER and for all the students that come along after them are really huge. Excellent point, excellent point. Um, so uh, two more questions, if we can try and squeeze them in, we'll see. Um, William Carr's asking about um, in the RISE analysis, uh, we're collecting data across the entire country, is there uh, a way to see the differences between the inputs from various institutions, um, where it's coming from, and, and is that taken into account at all? There is not, unless we come to your campus to do a workshop with your faculty. And if we come, like when we went, when we went to Ole Miss recently, we did a workshop just focused on um, the writing course, the composition course. And in that context, we filtered out all the data except for their local students' data. So the RISE analysis that they saw had their students' data in it. It was their list of top 10 most difficult outcomes, uh, et cetera. Now, is there a ton of movement in what are the 10 hardest outcomes, like from one institution to another, to another, to another? It, it's not that big. It's some order switching. It's a couple of things on the bottom pushing off and a couple of new things pushing on. It's, it's kind of surprisingly stable. Um, but in, in a local workshop setting, then what you'll see is you'll see just your data. Um, but you wouldn't see just filtered out like some other school's data. That's that school's data and you wouldn't see that. Okay. You'll either see everything or you'll see just, uh, just the data that are relevant to you. Great. The last one uh, is good because it's a little bit forward looking and it's just a, a question of, oh, uh, to be published and disseminated. Oh, I haven't even, well, before we can publish and disseminate anything, people have to make contributions. <laughs> so the, the initial concern is how do we get the word out about this? How do we tell a story that people understand and think is interesting and they can see the value of making improvements and particularly, um, as we've been talking about, maybe even getting students involved in that process? Will the tenure and promotion letters work, et cetera? I, I think the first paper that, that would likely come out of this, I think, um, more so than being about maybe differences in student learning outcomes based on improvements. We've written papers like that in the past. Those would be kind of here we saw that phenomenon again kind of paper. I think a really interesting paper would be to see something like the degree to which contributors do ask for tenure and promotion letters and the degree to which their committees did find that evidence to be compelling in some way. And if we could pull all of that together and say something publicly and loudly along the lines of, look, when we make it, when we make OER activity something that actually contributes to tenure and promotion, 
then people are willing to engage in it. And when more people engage and it becomes more sustainable and, and be able to you know, say something about the, a greater need for recognition of OER related work in TNP policies. I think that would be the first paper I'd probably want to go after. Excellent, excellent. So being mindful of the time, I want to thank, uh, thank you, David, for your, uh, the presentation, but I want to thank everyone who came and stuck it through uh, for being here. Um, as I've uh, made clear, we'll make sure to send out uh, a link to this recording for everyone. Um, and uh, of course, uh, you can go to the lumenlearning.com slash approving learning um, for, for more information on the project and, and how to participate. And to sign up for the listserv so we can notify you about upcoming workshops and trainings and things. All right. And with that, I think we'll close it up. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Take care. <laughs>